Welcome to round number six of the 1966 Formula One World Championship in Grand Prix Legends, deep in the misty woods surrounding the town of Nürburgring for the German Grand Prix. The German Grand Prix kicks off the second half of the short nine race 66 season, a season which has so far been dominated by Sir Jack Brabham in a car of his own name. But it's been a pair of second place finishes for our favorite racing hero, Richie Axelson at both Brands Hatch and last time out at Zandvoort, bringing the underpowered Eagle up the grid and finding a rhythm after a hectic start to the season. The German Grand Prix has long been a cornerstone to the Formula One calendar, taking place on the series' longest course, the 14-mile Nürburgring. Nothing really compares to racing this narrow band of tarmac through the woods. For 1966, promoters had taken notice of the short grids from earlier rounds. Due to the new engine regulations, Formula One had struggled to attract a full grid of cars for races. And so to ensure there would be enough activity on the colossal course to warrant spectators, the event was run as a combined Formula One and Formula Two race. This decision proved to be a good one, as in the build-up to the race, season-long entrant Rob Walker's Cooper, driven by Joe Sifford, and struggling upstart team McLaren withdrew from the event. But despite the short entry of proper Grand Prix machines, the key teams were in place to try their hand at the Classic. And although engine power would be as important as ever, the struggling teams had a bit more hope that the twisty and unpredictable nature of the course would even the playing field. Jack Brabham was coming in on an unparalleled three sequential victories and looking to make it four, while his teammate Denny Holm was still looking for first success. Cooper fielded two chassis for John Surtees and Joachim Rent, while Ferrari brought three cars, two 66 models for Bandini and Parks, and a third smaller V6 model to be driven by sports car ace Scarfiotti. Team Lotus were once again fielding two modified 1965 cars with BRM Tasman engines for Jim Clark and Peter Arundel, while the Works BRM team themselves opted for the same strategy for Stewart and Hill. Dan Gurney was back once again in his Eagle, but had sadly opted for the smaller Climax four-cylinder engine. The Westlake still undergoing final testing, but hopes were high that it would appear soon. And so the rest of the 20-car Formula One grid was made up of private entrants, with MGM tagging along with Joe Bonnier in his Maserati for this one. Practice and qualifying have been a mix of wet and dry sessions, as so often is the case at the Nürburgring, and added even more challenge to the treacherous event. Exemplifying this, during the final practice, regular private entrant Guy Ligier had a terrifying spin-off track, colliding with a tree and suffering leg injuries that would put him out the remainder of the season. Race day dawned with the same mixed weather, not fully raining, but not dry either. Jim Clark had claimed the pole in his lesser-powered Lotus, but off the line it was Surtees and Brabham who out-dragged him to the first corner and set off into the distance. Then, as the field approached the fluke plots, John Taylor's privately entered Brabham made contact with a slower Formula 2 car, sending Taylor into the trees and into a burst of flame. After being pulled from the wreckage badly burned, he was transported to the hospital, ultimately succumbing to his injuries in the coming weeks. But the race continued on. Brabham came by leading after the first lap, having got around Surtees with Rint chasing close behind. Dan Gurney was up to P4 in his eagle with Jackie Stewart following and Clark, the pole sitter, having fallen to sixth. As the race went on, the ring's attrition and conditions took hold. It looked as though Holm would leap his way up the field, but retired to the edge of the circuit with ignition issues after eight laps. Jim Clark, struggling with his Firestone tires, spun into the trees on lap 11, luckily avoiding injury, but ending his race as well. Ferrari had a particularly abysmal day, with Parks sliding into the trees outside of Bergwerk on lap 9, just as Scarfiotti coasted back to the pits with electrical issues. But for all the chaos out back, the order up front remained the same, with Jack pulling out a 45-second lead on Surtees. He ultimately came through at the end of 15 laps to take the win in dominant fashion, his fourth in a row, with the two Cooper Maserati drivers of Surtees and Rint to round out the podium. Gurney had looked to have been a sure bet for an outstanding fourth when on the final lap he ran into electrical issues near Ardeno, costing him minutes and relegating his finish to just outside the points. And so a tragic but record-breaking German Grand Prix which highlighted the risk of the period. And so we're here to relive our own edition alongside Gurney once again in the 2.7 liter climax. Much like his real life performance, I'm hoping to capitalize on the good handling of the car and maybe some attrition along the way we can see if we can take that fight to Brabham. 
It's a steep ask. Still down on power, the straight at the end of the lap will highlight the engine's deficiencies. And so looking at the points as we come into round six, we start entering the drop rounds. For 1966, each driver's best five races are counted on the season. And so much like real life, although with slightly different rounds, Brabham looks to perfect his season, already having won four races. A single win in any of the last four races will guarantee him five for five and make anything but a tie impossible. And although it's definitely not impossible, it's definitely looking like a fight for second for our driver, Richie Axelson. Sitting third in points and just one behind Surtees, the points paying result for the German Grand Prix will drop the round we each didn't score and likely establish who's chasing who towards the end of the season. With drop races, it will always tighten the battle as it nears the end, and really everybody through the top six, at least, is still a threat to challenge for runner-up. And so looking at the course, this is the Nordschleife that everybody knows and loves. 174 turns, 14.1 miles around. This is the version of the track, though, as it was uh, for the late 1960s, starting in 1967, that has the little chicane after the tier garden section and the long straightaway. 1966 was actually the last year that ran without that, but it's not something that exists for Grand Prix Legends. So we'll be running the track as it was just one year later, which results in slightly slower lap times, but overall very similar course that was run in 66. It's a track where you could do a thousand laps and still have plenty to learn, but for the Grand Prix Legends diehards who've raced enough laps around here, that it's almost certainly most folks' favorite. Racing the Eagle around the course, it's definitely a momentum type track. Have to try to keep the speed up in the corners as much as possible, since acceleration is not the forte of the engine. But towing that line between pushing a little bit too hard and running wide and hitting a sign or a tree is always the balance with a track like this. Because the track's so long, the real Grand Prix was run over 15, just 15 laps of the course. And so keeping with the one third distance we've been running the whole season, that means we'll be doing just five laps around the track. But five laps is a pretty good race at the Nürburgring and certainly enough time to let it all sort out. So then we look at the starting grid and it's Lorenzo Bandini for Ferrari taking the pole with an eight minute, 24 second lap. I think you'll obviously be looking to do something much better than the real life performance for Ferrari, but he starts alongside Jim Clark in the smaller Lotus, backing up his real life performance and starting up towards the front. Jackie Stewart starts in the third position with John Surtees in the Cooper alongside. A four wide start for the Nürburgring makes the grid quite interesting. Really all four cars up front have an equal shot at getting the run to the first corner. And you can see that's why in real life, Surtees and Brabham were able to outdrag Clark into turn one. But on the second row, it's Scarfiati alongside Parks with the other two Ferraris on the inside behind their teammate. And then Jack Brabham, the championship leader, starting back in seventh. So not quite as good as I think he would have hoped, but only the second row back with a pretty clear shot up the outside. And he'll be looking to take advantage of that and hopefully get a good start and up into the lead. But then we look back to the third row and we find Richie Axelson starting in eighth with an eight minute 30 flat, pretty much quite a bit faster than my teammate Dan Gurney starting back in 10th and just a little bit off of Jack Brabham. I think for the car, it was a pretty good lap and the time might look pretty severe from Bandini, but with some traffic and some good luck, you never know what can happen. Looking through the rest of the grid, I'm started alongside Graham Hill. Jochen Rint starts back in 12th right behind us and he'll always be one to try to charge towards the front. You have to look all the way back to 15th to find Denny Holm, who had some troubles in practice, I think much like real life with some teething issues with the Brabham, only able to qualify in 15th out of the 19 car grid. So the German Grand Prix is always one that I look forward to, as it's probably the most pure driving race. It's always a toss up whether or not you're actually going to race somebody else during this one, or if you'll just get off on your own and see where you finish. But either way, it's always a good time. Just as we did at Spa, the other wet race on the season, I'm running somewhat foggy type, rainy looking type weather. Grand Prix Legends doesn't simulate rain weather super accurately, so it's mostly just for visuals to give it that nice 66 type vibe. And so we'll be peering through the mist to see if we can see what's ahead and hopefully avoid any of the chaos that's out there. But I've been waiting a long time to do this one. So let's get started with the 1966 German Grand Prix. So here we are on the grid. We've got Graham Hill to my left, Dan Gurney next to him. All three Ferraris right in front. Flag is up. Down, we're underway. Try to 
to control the wheel spin off the line. Get a pretty good launch there. Stuck in behind Scarfiati though. And Parks to the left. So we'll come down towards the first corner. Ooh, Vandini kicking up a lot of dust there to the right. He's going to run off the track pretty well. So we'll come into the first corner. I think Brabham able to sneak in front as I'll slip up the inside of the two Ferraris. We'll come into the long right-hander here. Try not to make contact with the wheels. Parks up the inside. able to get the jump Scarfiati behind in the smaller Ferrari and Brabham able to get around as well unfortunately we'll come down to the end of the straightaway though it's down a second gear we'll come on to the Nordschleife of proper away from the spectators away from the start finish line and the crews first gear here at the top of the hill brake check a little bit with parks try not to over rev getting up to second gear I think I smacked the top of the rev range just a little bit Right, coming to the hots and box section. Really tricky in this car. The gears feel all wrong through here, but it's all a compromise around the whole track. Park's quite wide there. There's just nowhere to stick it around. Pretty much one, one lane, single file through here as everybody's getting stretched out just a little bit. The one car running away in the front. All right, into Kittobacher to the right. Trying to get a nice run out of here down the hill towards Flugplatz then. Ugh, hectic start as always. The four wide start at the Nürburgring makes it always crazy here, but we'll come to the top of the hill and try to launch nice and straight. Not over rev the car, just get out of the throttle as it gets up into the air. Double right hander here and onto a really fast section of the course. Fourth gear there. We'll get up to fifth for the first time. You know, one car way up in the lead and then a little pack. And then they're all running away as we get on the straightaway here. But hopefully in the slow stuff I can keep up. All right, long left-hander coming to Arenberg. Down to third gear, down to second. A little quite quick, a little too quick. Just try to run it out. Coming to Foxhole. I got Scarfiati behind me. He has maybe a BRM looking, but... Should be able to pull away from them, I think. Scarfiati in that V6 Ferrari. All right, to so the bottom of the foxhole. You need to lift there, a little bit of brakes. You'd have to make the car so stiff to go flat out there, it wouldn't be worth it. The rest of the lap, right down to first gear. Into at an hour. We'll get on the accelerator, a little bit shallow with the RPMs. Bogged down just a little bit there. Second gear, double left-hander. Come to the top of a hill, and we're going to rush down towards the village itself now. As Brabham's looking all over that Ferrari that's in front of him. I'll do the same to the one behind. Parks a little bit wide there. Come down to first gear. Oh, he's able to stick it out there. How do we go too wide through there? There we go. Get in front of him. My God. Second gear. Try not to run wide on the exit. Come into dry wrecks, making a pass at the most unlikely place. I don't think I've ever passed a car there. Callenhard's not a place where you would usually pass. Down to first gear, slowest corner on the track. And Parks had a little bobble right before it, so I was able to sneak up the inside of him. All right, come down to the village. I've got Parks right behind me now. Second gear, just nice and easy. It's an easy one to run wide on. Come to X Mule. Keep it in second, maybe. A lot of wheel spin at the top of the hill. Get it on the dirt just a little bit. Kick some up in Park's face. All right. I think I've got that position for sure then. Focus forward. See the Ferrari disappearing behind me. Come out to Bergwerk. Second gear. Actually pulling up here on, I think, Bandini. It must be Bandini with Brabham right behind him. We've got. Jackie Stewart up front, battling with another car, and then one way off in the lead, so I think I'm in sixth. Really fast section here, it's an easy one to get it all wrong on, get up to fourth gear. We're working our way now towards the carousel. 
I'm actually able to stick with these guys quite well here, but I think it's maybe Jackie Stewart holding them up. At least this little pack. Have to imagine Brown's a lot quicker. Is whoa, way too wide there. Just hung on to it. Got the wheel right onto the dirt. Slid out wide. Second gear then. Oh, as they're swapping places in front, cutting each other off. It's so coming to the right-hander here. Get up to the second and focus towards the carousel. Tricky on the opening lap with other cars around. Just don't want to go too fast going into it. It's better to slow down just a little bit more, let the car drop in, and then accelerate as you come on through. Don't want to pop out the high side of it as I almost do there. Jump up to second gear then, under the banner. And now work towards second part of the lap the end of the end of the lap work downhill here in just a minute all right hoa oxed highest point on the track we'll jump over the top there and now point us back towards the start tricky part of the track this a lot of the corners blend in and look the same with each other so I'm just trying to stick with this pack in front. I think I'm just quick enough to keep up with them. If they make any mistakes, have any kind of incidents, I'll be there to capitalize on it. Second gear through all this. Double left-hander. There's a few extra jumps and bumps that were flattened out in later years, like this one. Even more severe in real life. Up really well here. It's everybody slow coming up the hill. I'm just looking for a place around, see if I can slip up next to grab him into Flans Garden, but this is a really tricky one as he almost hits me there. So the apex falls away. Ooh, almost looks like I'm toying with him, but you really have to make sure you make a full pass if you're passing. You don't want to make wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact at all. Just totally ruin the suspension. We'll come over this really tricky hill. Need to slow down a lot for it. You can see the rear of the car kick up a lot there, and it spins out if you're not too careful. All right, work towards the end of the lap. I can't believe I caught them in the middle there, but they all kind of slowed each other down. Whoever's up front, it looks like a Cooper. Might be Surtees then. I don't see rent anywhere as so we'll come into the second carousel this one even trickier i think than the first one dip it in let the car do the work again all right we come towards the straightaway second gear the top of the hill want to get a great exit here not expecting a lot out of the climax on the straightaway as everybody starts to pull away i can already see it get it up to fourth gear all right, so one car way out front there. That must be Jim Clark. So unlike real life, he was able to get away in the lead and is pulling on all of us. We'll come over that little hump there, lift the throttle. I blew an engine there in practice. But flat out in fifth gear, I don't have anybody behind me, so I've successfully pull, pulled away from Parks. And I almost caught Brabham in the middle of the lap there, so I need to try to stay close and see if I can do that again. Come through, whoa, oh, tear guard in there. and come up to the chicane which wasn't there in 1966. This is Parks as I just said I got away from him. He's able to pull in on me on the straightaway. He's now back right behind me. So I'll come through though to complete the first lap. First of five come across the line. All right. So picked up quite a few spots, a decent first lap, but now I really get to work and try to hold on to it, maybe pass a couple more cars. Down to second gear, down to first for the first corner. So easy to overdo it. It's unusual for it to be this packed up. A lot of times folks just get away from each other and it becomes quite a lonely race, but so far it's all quite close together. Get it back up the gears. All right, yeah, P6, four laps to go. It's Brabham in front, Parks behind, just like I thought. All right, second gear here. You can see the castle Nürburgring in the fog there to the right. No 
major incidents through the first lap. Just a lot of close racing. But I have to think if they keep it up, there might be some fireworks to cut the track quite a lot there coming into Hatzenbach. You would definitely not cut the track in real life, blow a tire on the rocks and dirt. Brabham's fighting quite hard. With Bandini right in front there, come through Kidobacher. He's able to pull back out on Park, so I'm a lot quicker through the twisty stuff. It's just the straightaway that he pulls back in on me. Come over the top of the rise. You want to try to land as much on four wheels as possible, but sometimes you launch off the ground quite crooked and it makes an interesting landing. Fourth gear then over the top of the hill. Then fifth. If Clark can run away from this group before Brabham gets through them, he might have a shot at winning this thing. But if Brabham gets clear of this group, then I have to think he would catch Clark as well. But still a long race to go. Come through Aremberg. Just keeping my eye on the mirror there as Park close in. Parks closes in just a little bit through that fast section. I can just see. Jim Clark in the mist ahead. Right through the big dip down to third gear. Just let the speed run off up the hill. Whoa, spinning car in front. That's Jackie Stewart. I don't know if somebody hit him, but he spun off the track there into Adenau. see another BRM behind, so I don't know if he picked it back up. It would be unlikely. Green flags there, though, so all clear ahead. So that takes care of possibly the slow car in front that was holding everybody. It's much like real life. Some accidents here early on. I've seen a lot of accidents this season so far, and it's true in the real races as well. 66 was an especially dangerous year. All right through dry wrecks. Ran a bit wide in the middle of it, but this is where I close in a lot on this group in front. Down a first gear, lock up the left front slightly. Right, run it down to the village, just nice and easy on the way in. It always looks like you can go a lot faster than you can. The track really closes up here over the bridge. It's these three going to slow each other down through Exmule. All right, nice run on them. Oh, good run here, but we're on the straightaway here and not really a place to pass through the kink. Oh, right out to the sign. Got side by side with Brabham there for just a second, but that's such a sketchy place into Bergwerk. Stuck up behind Surtees, I believe. Surtees is a lot slower than I think we were expecting in that Maserati. Allowed Bandini to get in front, though, and get away. All right, grab them looking side to side. Almost want to let them sort it out in front of me and then take what's left, but it might be my only shot to get in front of Brabham. So we'll come out to the top of the hill. Can't really pass here. line them up coming towards carousel right hander just missed the apex there Whoa, he swings to the inside as well just slam on the brakes oh, i was just going for the move as he did it either to block or to try to make his own move maybe didn't even see the mirrors wouldn't expect the eagle to be there all right coming to the carousel then first gear He's probably being held up, but I gotta get around him. Right, second gear to the top of the top of the mountain, top of the track. This car is really nice to drive here. It's just a shame it's down on power. Hopefully the 
ad added engine capacity of the bigger engine as I almost lose it there. Hopefully it doesn't really disrupt the weight balance, although it'll feel a lot different with a bit more weight in the back. But that's one of the reasons this car, despite having much less horsepower, is still competitive here. It's just much lighter than all the rest of the cars. Through a track like this, weight definitely matters. A little jump there. All right, these two, I'm very, very close again. As Brabham dips to the inside, I was thinking about it again. Where can I sneak past? These two are definitely gonna cause an accident. Try to get a nice run down Flans Garden. dueling with Brabham. He's just able to take up just enough of the track where you can't slip alongside of him. Over the jump there, man. Almost lose the rear end. All right, come back down, get the car settled. Once again, really, really close through there, but he's still stuck up behind Surtees. I wonder if that's all gonna change on the straightaway. So come up towards the second carousel. Can't even see Bandini in front anymore, so he's obviously pulled out quite a lot. We'll get crossed up here. Somehow the car landed in the carousel. Parks is still not too far behind. He might catch me on the straightaway. All right, just try to get a nice run out here. On the accelerator nice and early, but it's not gonna be much hope. Just try to stick with him. Actually, they didn't get quite the run just because they're dueling. And I see side by side ahead. I think Bandini might be going for the lead on Clark. All right, fifth gear, just lift up the top of the rise. Just trying to stay in the slipstream. They're starting to pull away now. This Brabham's looking towards the inside. It's a tricky corner to pass on, though. We'll back out of it. Oh, they both back out of it, too come up to tear garden then hard on the brakes grab him so late on the brakes here down a first parks didn't catch me that time though pulled in just a little bit but i still have a nice lead on him it'll be good to build a cushion there i won't have to worry about it at all come across the line though well brabham's a bit slow on the front straightaway come down to the first corner to get it late on the brakes but he's very good there i think he backed out of it across the line maybe signaling to his crew about something all right understeer through the long right hander just get on the throttle help get the car to rotate there we go all right so still fifth three laps to go right between parks and brabham the end of the lap, I pull out so much on parks throughout the whole lap, but then the end, he's able to claim it all back with that Ferrari. All right, down to first gear. Oh, grab him looking up the inside of Surtees. Car kicks sideways quite a bit. All right, second gear here towards the bottom of the hill. one of those places where sometimes you can slip by if they make a mistake. They take a lot of grass to the inside there. Right on the gearbox. Shift it down into first without the brakes there. It's always fun. Grab him's right in front. He actually checks me up there just a little bit. gonna be so hard to pass i have to push so much through the slow corners big jump there over the top of the mountain is a little too big it's so easy to lose the car if you're not careful they're gonna be a little more conscious of that but i have to push so hard through the slow stuff to just stay close to them that very uncomfortable driving almost over driving the car to an extent I'm still stuck up behind Surtees here, though. I'm just waiting for him to nip around. Oh, he looks to the inside. Got the best seats for the battle. All right, up to third gear. We'll rush down the hill and 
can just see one car skating away in front. Oh, this Brabham's so slow here. There's not a lot of places to slip by though. I have to let out of it. It's gonna let parks close up a bit more. Turn this into a four car race for third. Past the scene of Jackie Stewart's crash. Nowhere to be found, so maybe he was able to drive away. I don't think he hit anything. I think he just slid off the track there. It's too bad for Jackie, though. He was in a good spot. Big skid marks there to the right. Missed the gear. Went for third. Was in second. All right, down to first into Callan Hart. So transfixed on the narrow strip of pavement here. Right on the back though of Brabham again. It's all through the slow stuff, but it's the hardest place to make a pass. He's gonna look to the inside of Surtees and set him up on a weird line coming into the town, second gear. Right out to the wall. So we'll head up into X Mule. Cut the track just a little bit there. Will they get bogged down? Slip up the inside. All right. Nip around both Surtees and Brabham. Slid maybe a little bit wide through X Mule. Was able to catch both of them and pass them up the inside. Second gear. Try not to throw it away here, but get as quick as I can onto this fast section. Hope that Surtees is just a little bit slower than I am. Seems like he's having trouble accelerating. Maybe the Maserati is going bad in his car. I think that puts me up to third though, but we'll just try to pull away. Oh, don't slide and hit the fence or the signs. I come up to the chicane. There's a little bump right in the middle of it that really upsets the car right there. Get down to third for this left-hander. The hold station with him behind. It looks like Parks is tacked onto the end of that pack, but is able to just scoot around in time. Brabham got held up big time. So hopefully I can build up a little bit of a gap. A little bit of a gap before Brabham gets around him. We'll come to the carousel. Just nice and easy here. Aim for the tree, down to first gear. Let the car fall in. Almost want to slow down. Just quite a lot more than you think you do. Here we go. All right, you can just see a car ahead. It doesn't look red, so I wonder if Bandini's gotten around Clark up front. Down to second gear towards the top of the hill. Past the spectators. We've just seen that Axelson's gotten past Surtees and Brabham. All right, second gear, just nice and easy. So rhythm track, especially in a longer Grand Prix, you end up driving alone for the majority of it. You don't see a lot of other cars. I don't think we'll see any lap traffic on this one, unlike the other races. With the F2 cars that were in the real race, maybe you would have seen them once or maybe twice during the race, but it's largely a lonely driver's race. And I think that's why so many folks love it. it up. I don't have to worry about running into the back of anybody this time through here, but Flans Garden, such a tricky corner. Missed the entry slightly, but able to gather it up. It's one of those corners that you seem to never get right. Third gear here. All right, come over the top of this hill. It's another one. It's easy to spin the car out. See the rear end just kick up off the ground. You can fix that with setup a bit, but it's all a compromise with other parts of the track. Just see the Lotus, I think, in front. Dip away, second gear here as we come towards the second carousel. It's all quiet now, there's no cars, other engine sounds, it's just my own car and me. Nice and easy, second gear, just 
ease it through. There we go. I get a good glimpse at the gap in front as we come onto the straight. All right, hard on the accelerator, third gear, just grind through the corner. There we go. Can't see anything in front. The fog's quite thick in the distance. There he is. Just going over the rise there. So not out of touch completely, but quite the gap in front. See if we can catch him. Just a little lift over the rise. You can barely see the cars in the mirror too, so they've really held each other up or had some sort of coming together. All right. Just a big lift. Get the car to point in, and then hard on the accelerator towards the end of the lap. Be exhilarating to go straight through the start-finish line without this chicane. You can see why they did add it. One of the only major modifications to this track over the years was that chicane. And of course the whole Grand Prix section here, but for the Nordschleife itself. Alright, come across the line. Just a couple more laps to go. We'll see the pit board in a second. You can see Bandini flying by there to the right, so Bandini definitely in the lead and he is far ahead. the first corner I could see Surtees I think Parks behind me we'll see in a second who's leading who that would be a good sign if it's not Brabham I'm not sure where Brabham is behind yeah Surtees is the one behind me so two laps to go P3 on the podium for the German Grand Prix and no sign of Jack Brabham behind All right second gear let's try to build a gap between these two end of the lap they're definitely a bit quicker but I should be able to pull it out through the start of the lap at least. Oh, a bit wide onto the dirt. Don't need to be doing that. Tires are fully up to temp now. The fuel's feeling good in the car after burning off some of that weight. Just nice and steady here. I think I've easily got the pace over the whole lap to pull away from them. Without Brabham there though, Surtees might have a little more confidence to push so he seems to be getting quite close here as we'll come through Kito back here we go always feels like you're either over revving or bogging down in this car the climax engine nice four wheel landing there Lots of spectators looking at the cars, jumping over the rise through Fulu plots. Just saw Jim Clark disappearing there. He might have pulled out just a little bit too much in those early laps to have a hope of catching, but a lot of track to go. Two laps around the Nordschleife is easily 10 or more at other tracks. come down down the gears downshifting the whole way up the hill second gear is we'll tip it in and then first into add an hour force there second gear oh, a bit wide on the exit I'm just trying to carry the momentum as much as I can yeah, I think I'm a little bit faster than Surtees but not much very very even down to Callen Hard. Lock up the right front just a little bit as we try to get it down the gear. Dancing on the pedals there. Just don't overdrive it. So much to throw away at this point. Dry Rex there. It was a little bit closer on the first apex, but it worked out. Just end up slowing down the exit a little bit if you're too tight. All right, down to first. Over rev just a little bit. Of just a little bit, so I need to get a little better at everything. All right, second gear. The car the whole time is just 
sliding, moving side to side. Come through X Mule. Over rev just a little bit. Once again. But pulled out a good amount on Certes there. So passing him the last lap through there and gaining a little bit. It's maybe my better corner. Just the lighter Eagles, just a little more nimble. All right, very, very far ahead now. Pulled a ton on him through Bergwerk. Really set my eyes forward unless I hear him again behind. But no sign of Clark or Bandini in front as of yet. Up to fourth gear. We'll come towards the chicane. Right over the bump there. Use it to pitch the car in. Just saw a car disappearing over the top of this hill. That would be a lot closer than I was. Sliding it sideways and really laying rubber down as we slide around. Nice and easy into the carousel. It was horribly bumpy in real life. Nice and smooth here though, and there he is. Not so far ahead then, Jim Clark. Might have a shot at this. Might just be quicker through that section. That car never was a performer. It's the 1965 Lotus with the BRM Tasman engine in it. They've given up on the H16, especially at a track like this where you need to shift. The gearbox is so unreliable in that car. It's a car I drove for the French Grand Prix. Can't imagine it at a track like this. bit wide so many places to go a little wide never never do the perfect lap you can always do better and I come over the bump through Brunchen I believe it's called every corner on this circuit has a name and I think I know a handful of them but definitely not everyone right Flans Garden again to try to dip it there we go Finally got the apex. There he is, just screaming away. Definitely closer on this lap, but with only one more lap after this, I don't know if there's enough time. Just try to stay on him. Maybe I can force him to break something if I go too hard. Just easy over the rise here. There we go. Try not to break something myself with over revving. Second gear to so come to the carousel. This one's harder in my opinion. It's just easier to fly out the top of it. You have a little more track there to work with. It's not quite as sharp of a corner. You almost wonder if that corner would be better without it. All right. Try to get onto the straightaway. Clark might have just a little bit more speed than me on the straight, but not much. Ugh, such a hard job lapping this circuit. I'll just do one more lap after this. Ugh, over rev the car quite a lot there. I just got off the accelerator too early. understeer at high speed on low fuel so you can be careful at the end of the straightaway or any fast corner all right down the gears Ooh, down to first onto the grass just a little bit we're all right car shot just a little bit faster than i was thinking it would all right so we'll come to the line just one lap to go i think holding on to third place here and you can see clark just coming into the first corner now Try my best to catch him on this lap, but he's just out of reach. This guy 
guide it around, understeer the whole way until you can get a little more throttle on. There we go. All right, past all the spectators. So one lap to go. You can hear the other cars streaming past. Clark in front, Surtees behind. A lot of action early on here. It's streamed out just a little bit, but lucky to get around Surtees when I did. And no idea where Brabham went. Maybe the Repco finally broke after his great run the past few races. All right, down the gears, first gear. More of a slalom section of the course. A little too much sliding, but able to pick it up on the exit. Oh, run a bit wide there. Just see Clark nip out of view. It feels like every corner I come around, he's just disappearing. Just enough to keep me pushing. All right, come over the top of the hill, try not to do anything crazy this time. Big launch, car gets really squirrely on the exit. It's dabbed the brakes there. Spectators would love it. Kick up dust on the exit. All right, over the hill, up to fifth gear. Right at the top of the rev range there. Right down to second into Aremberg. Sliding the tires the whole way around, really punishing them on this lap. Should be able to see Clark here. Oh, he streams up the hill. He's so far ahead. Almost bottom out at the bottom of the hill, down to third. He's going to be just out of reach for me, but you never know what can happen. The Lotus was not the most reliable car. So at this point, I just need to get to the end and see if I have any good fortune. Again, skid marks on the track back there, too. I don't know what that was from. I wonder if there's been a lot of attrition out back. All right, down to first. Another black mark there. That might have been from myself last time through. through Callenhard here. And Trirex just missed the first apex. That ah, kind of went out of the whole thing. Really cut the track there through the second one. Kick the car sideways coming down the hill. Just one more time through this section, nice and easy. The bridge just sneaks up on you to the right there. Exit to the town. I'm down to first. Over revving a bit as I rise up the hill. It's so hard to get your tires to connect there. You just get a lot of wheel spin. And I think that might, might be why I passed Surtees there. Especially with the higher powered Cooper. He just had a bit too much wheel spin. All right. Bergwerk and onto the fast section here. No sign of Clark in front, so I think I'm very much on my own at this point. A lot of frantic driving and just need to close it out now. Fourth gear. Lift off the throttle just a little bit extra. Make sure we don't run wide. Carry the speed through the right hander. Miss the apex slightly. All right, down to first gear. Awkward shift up to second there. It's just the narrow power band of the Climax engine. Just a lot of shifting. You only have five gears, but you use every one of them. Right there 
Lars Clark may be pulled in slightly, but it's not going to be enough on pace alone. More skid marks to the right there. A little bit fast here coming up the hill onto the dirt just slightly. Don't want to throw it all away now. So close to the end. behind me though so it's really all about closing it out here not a lot of camber on a few of these corners to help you out especially ones like these Just long flat Thought about going down to first there, almost did it. All right, into Flans Garden. Run a little bit wide. No sign of Clark in front. I think I've really fallen off. Either that or he's just very quick, as Jim Clark does. All right, just a few sections to go now, though. Just nice and easy over the rise here. Oh, I got very crossed up over the top of the hill. All right, through the slalom and out towards the second carousel for the final time. Second gear. All right, just the run down the straight now. Keep it in third through the top of the hill. Oh, white flag in front. That usually means a slow car, maybe one of the back markers. So just be a little careful. I can see one car ahead, but I think that's Clark. I'm nervous coming over the top of this hill. There's going to be a car sat in the middle of the road. I don't see anything. Usually the white flag means there's a slow car on the track somewhere. I have to wait for the next marshal. They're quite, marshal posts are quite far apart here. Hopefully not going to be on the other side of this left-hander. We'll take it a little easier. I got nobody right behind me. All right, no car. And no flags here either. So white flag for some reason. It might have been a car behind me then. Oh, yellow flag though. What's going on here in the final corner? I see a skid mark there. All right, we'll push it through though. Slow car on the track. It's Bandini. Oh, we'll come through though. Pass Bandini through the final carousel for final corner. It's not a carousel. What just happened? I think Jim Clark won. Oh my god. The Ferrari might have blown up right there at the flag. Yellow flag here. Maybe past the line in front of the marshals just being friendly with it. But no idea what happened there. Wave to the crowd a little bit. I'll have to see how the results played out, but I think Jim Clark got the win there. Something happened to Bandini. My God. And so there's the final results. And for the third straight race, Richie Axelson finishes in second. But this time, very much unexpected. Jim Clark gets the win after following Bandini for pretty much the whole race after he got past him. But coming into the end of the final lap, it looks like Bandini ran out of fuel or something happened to his Ferrari that left him coasting right at the end of the straightaway. Jim Clark able to squeeze past him myself too, seeing white flags, seeing yellow flags, didn't know where he was gonna be, but luckily found him at a good spot. Got around to finish second. You know, you always wanna do these things on pure race pace, but it was not gonna happen today with that Ferrari. So something breaking or fuel running out in the Ferrari and, and allowing me to get one extra step on the podium. But that gives John Surtees the third and final step of the podium in his Cooper but lots of attrition in this race. Scarfiati was able to finish in his Ferrari, the only Ferrari that finished. Bob Bondurant finishes in fifth and in the points, as well as Denny Holm picking up some points in the Brabham. And if we look further down, Chris Lawrence and John Taylor are the final finishers, John finishing this race as he wasn't able to do in real life. But then back in ninth, Lorenzo Bandini, one lap down because of some sort of crash. I think he might've coasted across the line, it's interesting. 
They didn't score his last lap. That was something very similar that happened to Dan Gurney in the real race. Even though Gurney, I believe, was able to come to the finish line, he was so late coming to the line that they didn't classify his final lap. But then we see the rash of accidents and mechanical failures, which the Nürburgring usually had. With Mike Spence, Mike Parks, Jack Brabham, the championship leader, Jochen Rint, Jackie Stewart, Peter Arundel, and Joe Bonnier all having accidents some point during the race. So with that, only eight of the 19 starters were able to finish, but in a race like this, it is all about finishing and finishing consistently. It was not my best drive, but it was able to get the car to the end without any major incidents, especially with some of the dueling early on and Jackie Stewart crashing in front. So it may not be earned in the most fair way, but I'll certainly take a second. So looking at the driver's points and now factoring in the first drop race. Jack Brabham holds on to his lead in the championship despite not scoring here today. Before this race, Jack was the only one who had five scoring rounds, so his points total is effectively set unless he can better his second place finish from the Belgian Grand Prix. But then now, Richie Axelson is in second over John Surtees by just a single point, but dropping my DNF from Spa, I was able to pick up six points today for a run of three straight second place finishes. Best of the rest, as they say and am now on the board with five scored races. But with three races remaining and the promise of higher powered engines, it does mean I should be able to better my score quite a bit. John Surtees though, just one point behind and have to look at him and maybe even Jim Clark here as being contenders for the second spot in the championship. Jim Clark picking up nine full points for the win today really bumps him up quite a bit in the standings. And a quick look at the manufacturer's standings, and Brabham Repco did score today with Denny Holm getting a point. As they already have five counting rounds of higher points, they still hold at 42. Ferrari gained another three for their second place bid, as now Eagle Climax has risen to third in the championship off this string of second place finishes. So although we're set to remove that Climax engine at some point, it is good to see Eagle as a chassis manufacturer on the board. It will no doubt make our boss very happy. And so with the fact that it was not Surtees or myself who won today, it is Jack Brabham already tying up the 1966 Drivers' Championship. And it's tough to say it's not deserving with a team that was so ready coming into 1966. You can see why Brabham really took the Grand Prix world by storm. They of course were a manufacturer for many years up to this point, and Jack himself had already had a lot of time in the spotlight. But putting in the work to develop that V8 Repco engine over the winter racing in the Tasman series with it, racing in the South African Grand Prix with it. By the time the Formula One season got off in earnest, the rest of the teams were still in experiment and testing mode. And here we are, six races through six Grand Prix of 1966, and many of the teams still don't have full powered engines to race with. So it was almost always a done deal that Jack Brabham was gonna win the 1966 World Championship, but it's no less deserved that he's done so. And with that, we close the book on the 1966 German Grand Prix, but still three rounds in the Formula One season to go. And next up, at the beginning of September, it'll be time to put pedal to the metal for Monza. So until then, thank you for watching. This is GP Laps, and I'll see you all again next time.